Justin WPT Hero Rolo is a multi-table tournament specialist who has been playing for more than three years. He is currently a trainer for Poker Savvy Plus and Card Player Pro, and he shows an aptitude for both online and live games. His strongest finishes so far have been in the 2007 World Series of Poker, where he made a third place finish in a preliminary event and finished in 149th in the main event out of 6,358 entrants. His caches in those two events alone came to more than $300,000. His online results have been very impressive as well. He has earned more than $216,000 in online player of the year qualified finishes this year, including taking down three events, the 1K Monday on full tilt and the Sunday second chance and nightly 100 grand tournaments on PokerStars. Rolo got started playing poker while he was in college. He eventually earned a bachelor's degree before taking a serious look at becoming a full-fledged poker pro. We've got Justin on the phone with us right now to talk to us about what it takes to go from playing the game casually to becoming a pro, as well as other tournament strategy advice. All right, how you doing, Justin? Not too bad. How about yourself? I'm doing very good. Well, so was there a particular moment that you remember that kind of clinched your decision to go pro? Um, I don't think it was really one moment in particular. Um, it was sort of a snowball effect. Um, you know, with tournaments... You know, anybody can win one tournament, but it's, you know, when you start winning, you know, your second or your third or your fourth, then, uh, you know, it started to get in my head that maybe I could do it for a living. Well, and, like, you started winning your second, your third, and your fourth, and this is in the span of what kind of time frame? Um, you know, I got I actually got lucky pretty early and won a, uh, you know, a smaller tournament to help me build my bankroll. Um, but, uh, you know, within a couple of months, I... I Something clicked, and I, you know, I started to get it. And I think I won three tournaments uh, last January, and, and you know, in the span of a month, pretty big field tournaments. And at that point, I really, you know, started to put the pieces together that, um, you know, I could do this professionally. Okay. Well, I think a lot of people that are watching this are likely to be the kind of people that have dreams tumbling in the back of their heads about turning pro like you did, but they don't really know how to start the process or, you know, they don't really know when they're ready to cut loose and kind of just go for it. Do you have any advice for this? I mean, the one thing I would say to a beginning player that, you know, has kind of dreams of going pro is you you have to to take every step uh, in the process. You have to start with a small buy-in tournament. You really have to, you know, it might seem like a grind, but you have to work your way up through the levels because you just learn, you know, invaluable things um, as you're moving up. And it's sort of a, it's a neat process as it goes along because, um, you know, things that you learn playing $5 tournaments, you build on that playing ten dollar tournaments. Uh, things that you play in ten dollar tournaments, you build on in twenty dollar tournaments. So, I would say you know, don't just go for the big buy-in tournaments right away. Um, work your way up from the uh, the smaller buy-in tournaments. Well, and I would argue that there's a lot of difference in like the five dollar tournaments compared to the fifty dollar tournaments compared to the hundred or two hundred dollar tournaments. So when you're saying that you're building your way up. Uh, Aren't they so different, though, that you almost have to take a completely different approach approach to all of them? Well, okay, you know, I kind of think of it as we can we can think of it as a house almost. Um, you know, the five dollar tournaments are your foundation. It's how you play against poor players because you're going to have really bad players at every level. <laughs> so you need to have that basic knowledge of okay, this is how I play a bad player. Um, so you can label somebody as a bad player. You have that knowledge of how to play them. Um, you know, when you move up a little bit, this is how I play um, a little bit of a better player. That builds on the house. That's kind of the frame, you know. And uh, when you go to, say, a $200 tournament, you know, that's your finish stuff. You, you learn how to play good players. Um, but it all interconnects because you're not going to have a table with – um, all good players. You can have bad players, and you need to be able to play all of them. Right. That makes sense. Well, you said that you would suggest taking you know, the standard route by starting at lower and slowly going up the levels, and you said that it kind of could become a grind for a lot of players. Well, I think a lot of people that, are, that might be watching this see um, players like you or a lot of other young players that to them, it seems like they rose up the ranks very quickly. And so they may get discouraged by 
not moving up quite as quickly. I mean, how do you kind of deal with that kind of discouraging uh, progress? Uh, I mean, playing tournaments professionally is not for the faint at heart. Ninety um, percent <laughs> of the time, you're going to you're going to fail. You're not going to cash. Um, you know, tournaments only pay ten percent of the field. Um, so you know, you just have to you have to be able to gut your way through it. You don't necessarily have to be. Um, a winning player at five dollar tournaments, but you need to know internally that you 've learned enough to move up. Okay. The variance is so high in in tournament play that um, you know as long as you know that you 've grown even though your results might not be sparkling because you didn 't get a win um, as long as you kind of understand that you 're ready for that next step, then you can move up but you know tournaments aren 't all about results. Um, you just have to know that you're making the, the right plays at the right times. Okay, that's great advice. Well, is it easier to learn poker by playing online than it is to learn by playing live? Um, you know, as far as physical tells, obviously live. Right. You know, there's no physical tells in online. Um, but you just can't come close to the amount of hands that you get in a very short amount of time um, that you get online. Then you get that, like, you know, you get maybe one-tenth of the hands live. Um, so online is, you know, the ultimate place to learn poker. And then, you know, you can worry about physical tells and the other parts of poker when you branch out and start playing live. But to learn playing online, you know, you can't beat that. Well, how detrimental is it then, in your opinion, to move from playing a lot of online poker to playing live poker, and now all of a sudden you have to incorporate all of these tells, and you also have to be cognizant of the own tells that you may be giving off. I mean, how detrimental is it to move to live and have to learn basically this completely new level of play? I mean, I, I honestly don't think it's that big of a deal. Um, I think in a very short amount of time you can get pretty comfortable playing live. Um, I think a lot of people do overrate live tells. Granted, it is part of the game, and if you have huge tells, then um, you know you're going to be giving away the strength of your hand. But it's not a huge deal. Um, there are enough good books out there that you can read about live tells that you can at least um, calm yourself enough so that you're not giving off these huge tells. Uh, I think Mike Caro has a, a really good book um, on tells, and you know I think once you just get the basics down, it's really not that it's not as huge a part of the game as um, say TV makes it out to be. Uh, a lot of it is you know betting patterns and how much does a person bet when they're strong, how much do they bet when they're weak. Um, those are the real tells that you can actually uh, exploit a lot easier than you know say somebody's ear is twitching when they're strong or. You know, their lip is quivering when they're weak. Right, absolutely. Well, just kind of switching gears a little bit, what kind of hand wins you the most money in poker, and why do you think that is? Uh, that has won me the most money? Yeah, what kind of hand? Um, you know, I would say probably suited connectors, little things like 7-6 suited or, you know, even 10-8 uh, suited, things like that. Because generally when you're playing them, uh, you're playing them in position because you don't want to be playing hands like that out of position. Um, and you're playing them in, in big multi-way raised pots. So somebody's, you know, raised, <laughs> a couple more people have called, and then you're coming along for about one-fifth of the pot, and when you make a hand, you're going to make a huge hand. Um, and when you don't make a hand, it's really easy to fold. So in general, you're not going to lose a lot on those hands. And, you know, I, I've just basically won, you know, a lot of my early chips in tournaments have come from suited connectors where, you know, I'll flop a flush draw and a straight draw, and then somebody with aces can't get away, and I end up getting there. So, um, you know, it's things like that where you're playing in these five- or six-way pots with these hands that, you know, basically you're never going to make a medium strength hand. You're always going to either make a monster or you're going to have nothing. So, you know, the your win-loss ratio should be a lot higher on those suited connectors. Okay. Well, you're talking about people not being able to get away from aces in that kind of hand. Um, what kind of hand loses you the most money? Um, ace queen, I think, bar none, loses me the most money. Um, I've stopped kind of playing it in early position, uh, early in tournaments, because, you know, it's the kind of thing where early in a tournament a lot of people play kind of tight. Um, so you'll raise ace queen off suit. Um, say you raise it under the gun, and you get a couple people calling. 
and a flop comes something like ace jack, you know, three, uh, you're behind ace jack and you're behind ace king, but it's still kind of a hard hand to get away from in, in some aspects because, you know, you do have an ace for the queen kicker. Um, and there are enough people that will that will stack off there with ace ten. But, uh, you know, it's just, you know, things like ace jack, ace queen, when you're out of position early in the tournament, it gets a little tough to get away from post-flop. So you normally have to commit, you know, extra chips on the flop when you hit. And, uh, you know, sometimes you're behind and you end up losing a lot of money, something like ace-king. So uh, <laughs> I probably lost the most money with ace-queen, but I think I've learned a lesson from it and I've kind of stopped playing in an early position. Well, yeah, pretty much any kind of hand or situation that you lose a lot of money, the best way to come away from it is to having learned a lesson. So... Yeah. What do you think sets you apart from the majority of tournament players as a winning player? Um, you know, I think a lot of people, you know, you can play tight aggressive early in tournaments, and it doesn't really hurt you because the blinds are so, uh, you know, they're so deep early in the tournament. You have 100 big blinds, but, you know, from like the third hour on, you're probably playing with a 30 big blind stack, and people don't really adjust. They continue to only play strong hands. And when you're that shallow, if you just, you know, relentless aggression, if you just use relentless aggression and continually raise and steal those blinds and antis, um, you know, it's just a really good firewall um, in the case that you get a bad beat against you. You have gained all these extra chips stealing blinds and antis relentlessly. Um, so it's just, it gives you kind of an extra life. Um, and a lot of players just don't, they don't get aggressive enough late in tournaments. And they don't realize the importance of stealing those blinds and antis a couple times in orbit. Okay. Well, I'm going to get a little bit more specific here. Let's say you have pocket tens under the gun late in a tournament at a full table. What considerations do you make and how do you act upon them? Um, well, I, I think tens might be, um, you know, sort of a, a weird um, hand for this example because, in my opinion, you know, at a full table or seven-handed late in the tournament, tens, you're always going to be raising. Um, basically, the only consideration that you have with tens at this point would be, uh, you know, your stack size. You know, if you have 12 big blinds, you're not going to be opening three times. You're probably just going to be open, you know, open jamming. You're going to be going all in. If you have 20 big blinds, then you might, you know, raise it two and a half times the big blind. Um, but tens, I'm always raising. Um, you know, if we maybe play devil's advocate a little bit and we go down to sevens, um, I'm looking at how passive the table is, um, you know, what my stack size is, how passive the table is, and, uh, you know, I make a determination of the frequency I'm getting three bet, um, things like that. Um, play into if I'm going to open up, say, a middle, you know, medium pocket pair. Um, if the table's super aggressive and I'm just getting raised every time, I might just be folding 7-7. Seven, seven. But if it's really passive, um, you know, I'll be probably raising 2-2 two, two under the gun, um, you know, with even no consideration of my stack size. If I know I can bully a table, uh, I'm going to be opening a, a much, much wider range um, than if I'm getting um, three bet constantly. Okay. Well, how about the same scenario with something like Ace King suited? Uh, I mean, once again, that's <clears throat> a lot of people play Ace King. I think for some reason, at some point in the line in a book, uh, somebody said that Ace King wasn't a made hand, and and people play it too passively. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's always a raising hand again. Um, I'll pretty much happily get my money in uh, if we're thirty big blinds deep. I'll pretty much always just happily get my money in with Ace King um, pre-flop if I can. Um, you know, a lot of the strength of Ace King comes from seeing all five cards, and even against something like Kings, you're only thirty. You know, you're still thirty percent. Um, so I mean, I'm always raising Ace King there. Uh, going back to the last question, you know, if we again we play Devil's Advocate and say Ace Jack. Um, you know, once again. My stack size comes into play and how aggressive the table is behind me and obviously my position uh, pre-flop comes into play as if, as to if I'm going to raise or, or if I'm just going to try to make a fold. All right. Well, that's all I've got for you, Justin. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Uh, no problem. It was nice talking to you guys. Nice talking to you, too. And if you would like to hear more hand-for-hand -hand strategy from Justin or any of the Poker Savvy Plus team of poker pros, check out the Card Player Pro feature on the homepage of cardplayer.com. Thanks for watching the Online Zone on Card Player TV.